Well, as ever, as ever do uh, keep Philippians 1 in front of you. Um, I will pray and uh, we'll then have a look together. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Lord, we come with souls needing reviving Uh, we come hungry for you and we come needing all your help and ask therefore for your spirit to be at work in us as we look at these words in one sense human words on a page but in another sense your very breath for our spiritual nourishment and we crave you today crave that you would speak to us and address us as we are for your name's sake. Amen. Uh, Imagine for a moment your life as a circle. Uh, In the circle is um, every single aspect of your life. Uh, In one part of the circle you will have uh, your family. Uh, Another part of the circle you'll have your work or your daily occupation. Another part of your family you'll have your friends Uh, Maybe things like hobbies and pastimes, your interests, the things that you like to do day to day. There'll be a part of the circle that has in it uh, your church activity, uh, your busyness with other Christians, Christian friends perhaps. And over the circle there'll be various things like your hopes, your anxieties, your fears, your dreams, your personality, your values and so on, filling out the circle that makes up your life. Now, as you look at the circle, just think for a moment of what lies at the very center of the circle. Um, Last week, we got to know in Philippians the Christians that Paul is writing to in Philippi. And this week, we're going to look a little more about the Apostle Paul who's writing to them. And in particular, what lies at the very center of his circle. Um, Philippians chapter 1 at least works very much like any other correspondence Um, we might write today where we say at the start how are you I hope you are well we ask about their situation and then we say I'm fine I had a really good week and we say something about our situation Paul starts in verses 1 to 11 with their situation and as we saw last week they're a church that is a cause for great rejoicing for Paul they spark joyful confidence about all that's going on That's because they're a a church that is joining in the gospel with Paul, partnership, partnering with him. And Paul prays, which is our prayer for the year, that they would excel in living as God helps them and grows them. And then Paul starts on his situation, verse 12 onwards. And because Paul's in prison, he mentions his chains a number of times in the letter, you might expect him to have to be brave facing it about prison food or complaining about the brutal guards when actually, verse 18 for example, he twice rejoices. Paul in prison, he's glad. He's really very well, thank you, because he's in prison. Well, it's not because he's in prison. The reason is because of what lies at the center of his circle. Uh, The reason is because nonetheless... Christ is still being preached. What is most important in life for him is proclaiming Christ. The thing that matters more than anything else for this man is that people hear and keep hearing the extraordinary news of Jesus Christ who's come as Lord and Savior. People hearing that is more important to him than anything else in his circle. Look at verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. It's really served the progress of the gospel, the saving news of Jesus coming and being heard by more and more people. That's what matters to me more than anything else. And because that's carrying on, I rejoice. He talks about uh, the progress of the gospel in different ways. If you've got it there, just have a look down at verse 14. Because of my chains, he says, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God. 
Verse 15, it's true that some preach Christ. Verse 17, the same business. The former preach Christ. And towards the end of 18, whatever motives people have, Christ is preached. If you imagine a big kind of uh, barometer, a big scale, or a big dial, and there is one of those scales or barometers for Paul's situation. And uh, the dial reading is low because he's in prison, he's physically uncomfortable. His personal situation scale, you look at it and the reading is really, really low. But he says, look, I'm not living by that scale. He says, I have a totally different scale, a totally different barometer. It's a gospel barometer. And however well or badly I am doing, I'm living now by the Christ being proclaimed scale barometer and on the gospel advancing scale the reading is wonderfully high that's the scale that I live by says Paul one of the ways it's advancing is verse 13 if you look again the next verse the gospel's really advancing he says as a result it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ there was a regiment of elite troops in the Roman army called the Praetorian Guard. If you've seen the film Gladiator, you may recognize... Um, <clears throat> could you click on Martin one slide? I seem to have run out of things here. There we are. That's a scene from the film Gladiator. That uniform is the uniform for the Praetorian Guard. 9,000 soldiers given special jobs, including the guarding of particular prisoners who were in, causing a bit of a, a menace. And they take it in turns for four-hour shifts to be chained to the prisoner to guard them and you can imagine the new guard coming on shift walking into Paul's cell he chains himself to Paul and to the wall looks at Paul and says so what are you in for then ah well yes I've, I've been speaking about Jesus Christ Jesus who ah Paul looks at his watch rolls up his sleeves we've got four hours here we go <laughs> it's the whole Christianity Explore course without the meal isn't it four hours potted together he must be rubbing his hands with glee and that soldier then goes back to the mess. He said, that fellow Paul's got to be in his bonnet about Jesus of Nazareth being the Christ or something. It's complete off his, off his trolley. And then the word gets out. The whole regiment knows. Everyone slightly dreads going on shift. Four hours. Oh, let me tell you. Let me tell you about Jesus. Even before his personal circumstances, Paul is driven by proclaiming Christ. There's nothing more important. And verse 14, there's another effect because... While he's in prison, verse 14, because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Some of you will know um, the name Jim Elliot, uh, a young missionary who died in 1956 trying to take the gospel to the Orca Indians in Ecuador and uh, was killed by them at the age of just 28. He was a graduate of Wheaton College. And after his death, along with four others, the numbers from Wheaton College graduates giving themselves to missionary service shot up. Masses of people putting themselves forward for missionary service. It is extraordinary how the suffering of some believers produces great courage and willingness in other believers. And Paul says, that's what's happened here for me. I'm suffering. It's hard in prison but it's been a real drive for other believers who've heard about it. It can happen on a small scale as well, can't it? Just think of your small group if you're in a small group. Praying time comes. Someone in the group mentions, yeah, I'm getting real prejudicial treatment at work for being a Christian. My family are being really unreasonable because they don't understand my church commitments. I'm being thoroughly disapproved by various people that I meet because I'm a Christian. And the brother or sister across the group are they not buoyed up to think, well, my goodness, if they're going through it as well, I can jolly well up my game for the week this week. And I can live for Jesus in the way they're living for him too. And the courage of some believers stokes up the courage of other believers too and helps us to live for him. Now the sad thing for Paul, verse 15, as you go on through, although some people are speaking up for Jesus more, their motives are very questionable in some cases. Just look at verse 15. It's true, he says, that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. 
if you imagine you're a church, you're a church leader in Rome and uh, the great apostle turns up in town and uh, perhaps if uh, you've been going along fine as a church leader it's possible you resent his arrival uh, if you're the leader of a very big church you don't like not being top dog in Rome anymore if you're the leader of a very small church you're still a bit bitter that God never called you to be an apostle and so when Paul's in prison, there's just a, a little opportunity to get one on over Paul and just to underline all the weaknesses that you've always thought about him and you think to yourself, well, if you will be so inflexible, Paul, with various things around the gospel, it's not surprising you're in prison. Or maybe you think, well, Paul, you're, you've obviously got a deep character flaw which God is putting you in prison for and that means there's an opportunity for me to, to take up the baton and to preach the gospel where you can't. Envy and rivalry envy being annoyed at a friend's success resenting other people being praised and rivalry I think that must still run on today when there's a, an inward gladness that say another church runs into trouble and there's some shocking thing some scandal we think never happened at this church there's just an inner kind of hmm, poor them and there are people it seems preaching Christ from envy and rivalry and verse 17 if you look down out of selfish ambition funny thing is that's a problem that's going on in the Philippian church which Paul is going to have to address in chapter 2 we'll come to it the sufferings are not nothing but because Christ is still preached whatever the motive Paul can still rejoice I wonder how the center of Paul's circle compares to the center of our circles all sorts of things matter to us good things and there'll be something that matters to us most more than anything else it might be financial security it might be peace and harmony it might be a wholesome family it might be a job a sought after relationship a travel plan no one would question the good of those things but we must ask ourselves as we look at the apostle do they occupy so much attention and time that they eclipse the advance of the gospel Paul could have been so bitter he could have been so grumpy don't you think life wasn't going as he planned but because he's so intoxicated with the need for people to hear of Jesus he submits every other aspiration to Christ being proclaimed if more people are hearing about the Lord Jesus I rejoice whatever else is happening to me Michael Griffiths was one time the director of a mission agency called the Overseas Mission Fellowship and he would talk about proclaiming Christ in terms of mission and missions and uh, he would give talks to churches and perhaps students to try and draw them into missionary service and he had a line I gather which went like this he said polite interest in missions is nauseating and many people in churches quite possibly could have a, a mere polite interest in the advance of the gospel. It's a good idea. I'm glad some people do it. And that's as far as it goes. And it's actually only as we adopt Paul's passionate commitment, his driver commitment over every other driver, that we can rejoice whatever happens to us. We can rejoice whatever the cost to us, whatever our circumstances are doing because that which is at the center of the circle is untouched and is even progressing and advancing the center of Paul's circle do you see it wasn't himself it wasn't how things are going for him it was how things are going for Christ is he being preached still now another reason that Paul rejoices is similar he's confident that whatever happens to him whether he's released from prison and tried, whether he's executed, whether he's allowed to go free, he's sure that Christ will nonetheless be honored and exalted, be lifted up. And he says that because what is even better than life, can you click, oh, here we are, what is even better than life is to be with Christ. Could you click me on, Martin? If there's one thing that's most important in life, it's that Christ is proclaimed. There's one thing, though, that's even better than life itself, and that is to be with Christ. Look on in verse 19. That's where we've got to. Paul continues to rejoice. 
He says, I continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Now, that's not a, a promise from God that he suddenly heard that he's going to be released from prison. He's talking, I think, about his final salvation, his deliverance to be with Jesus eventually, one day. Uh, it could be that he's taken the phrase from Job, of all places. In the Old Testament, Job was given all this supposedly helpful advice from his friends. And at one point, Job comes to say the same line. He says this whole experience of his suffering, he sure will turn out for his deliverance, his vindication before God, his final salvation. So Paul says, verse 20, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body whether by life or by death. If Paul is freed Christ will be exalted because he can go on preaching Christ. If Paul is killed Christ will be exalted because he will be known for having died for the Lord Jesus and Christ will be honored even then. That's all so good. It's a brilliant, it's a win-win situation for Paul. The only way he can say that is because there is something even better than life and that is to be with the Lord Jesus in person. Now look at verse 21 again. This is a, a well-known verse and uh, if you don't know it, <coughs> and even if you do actually, this verse will be good to memorize along with our prayer for the year. If your own Bible reading is struggling for a little bit, you could, you could sit in verse 21 for a good couple of weeks. Uh, can I suggest a little um, memory test, if you like? Why not start with the 12 words of verse 21? Let's just look at them. How come Christ will be honored in my body, whether I die or whether I live? Because verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain here's the win-win situation to live means he gets to keep proclaiming Christ verse 22 if I'm to go on living in the body this will mean fruitful labor for me I can come and see you Philippians again and encourage you in Christ and yet he says dying is gain that's an extraordinary thing to say isn't it there's two really good options here and he's caught between the two what shall I choose he says verse 22 I don't know he says I'm torn between the two I'm hard pressed between these two good options there's departing this life and being with Christ that's better by a long way that's his personal preference he doesn't know what to do it's an incredible way of thinking it's like someone isn't it, choosing their two favorite chocolates live, die, live, die mm, so tempting, both it's an amazing perspective just to be clear you can only have this perspective if you're a Christian person so whether you're a believer or unbeliever actually this is a great reminder isn't it of what, what makes the news of Jesus extraordinary and good and great we're going to remember it this morning uh, the thing that lies at the very heart of it as we remember bread, or rather we remember the body of Jesus and his blood in the bread and the fruit juice that we use here. We're reminded that his death is a punishment to pay for sin, a punishment ordinarily you and I should be receiving. We're remembering that that has been paid for us. That's how forgiveness can come to a person. But we're remembering too that Jesus physically arose from the dead. And the resurrection of Jesus proves that death is not the end of a person's life. And for the Christian, death, says Paul, I don't know if you believe this, death brings as much reward and meaning and satisfaction as life does. Dying, he says, is gain, better, more than. Now, if you're the authorities, that's a real headache, isn't it? You, you can't get someone who has that perspective. There's nothing they can do to Paul that's really going to annoy him in the slightest. A 19th century Christian called General Gordon, and uh, he was facing at one time the king of Ethiopia. 
and the king put him on the spot he said do you know that I could kill you on the spot if I liked and uh, General Gordon said do so at once if you want I'm ready what you're ready to be killed said the king certainly I'm always ready to die well then my power has no terrors for you none whatever said Gordon for I know Christ dying for a Christian person you see is a great option that's not a comment on the process of dying it's a comment on gaining being with Christ forever in fact it's the best option it's better than living says Paul because dying means to be with the Lord Jesus in a way we have never done before and however full your life it can never substitute for that if you don't believe that you're deficient in your understanding of Jesus Christ now I want to just give a bit of homework to us all um, and I've begun it this week if you're in a small group perhaps this week home groups are meeting you might like just to talk about verse 21 together for a bit no not this week it'll be the next time you meet in terms of the passages we're covering but why not do this as an exercise why not write out verse 21 and then leave blanks at the word Christ and the word gain to live is to die is to live is lots of things isn't it to live is family to live is personal comfort to live is enjoyment of the world because God's given us so much to enjoy to live is the next rung on the ladder to live is being known in my field to live is a pain free life to die is shame sad it's a tragedy, it's a loss, it's a dread. And if you're not sure what you'd fill in those spaces, what would the person who knows you best in the world put in those spaces for you? We like to have a bit of Christ, don't we? Maybe once or twice a week, but there are many things in life too. To die, it's to be avoided, postponed. Don't need to get so morbid when there's so much to enjoy in life. I believe in heaven, but hardly as gain, more like a consolation prize, because the life here has ended be easy wouldn't it to read Paul and think yeah well he was the apostle he's an extreme Christian he's not quite living in line with reality he doesn't know what life is like in 2017 but there's nothing extreme about it actually we're the ones who so often don't live in line with reality all existence revolves around Jesus Christ ultimate reality is being with him in person forever life now is to prepare people for that reality as we proclaim him to live is Christ he is our preoccupation now to die is gain we'll be present with him then now if dying is the obvious choice for the Christian it's better by far it surprises us perhaps how the end of the passage ends uh, Paul is facing this very close run decision how on earth is he going to decide well what steers decisions in life is others progress in the gospel we stopped very unnaturally didn't we at verse 23 let's go back to it he's on the horns of a dilemma I'm torn between the two he says I desire to depart and be with Christ which is better by far that's my personal preference by a long shot verse 24 but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body that's an amazing thing to say too because just think what his body's like at the moment he's been through all sorts of things he's probably got the scars to prove it bruises from shipwrecks here and there it's tempting for him to think it'd be a lot less hassle just to call it a day and to go to be with Christ now but remarkably he's happy to carry on in the body because it will help the Philippians verse 25 and 26 say how I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith I want you to advance in your faith so that through my being with you again your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me literally you're glorying in Jesus you're boasting in him and because that's possible I'll go for that because it'll help you I'll choose that option 
we're a congregation aren't we with a, a number of people near the end of their lives humanly speaking many of us are a good number of years and it may be that if that's uh, someone that you recognize for yourself you may have wished to have gone to be with Christ already but you find yourself still in the body however painful that is can I say that for the rest of us it's very good that you're still in the body the preaching of Christ is still what matters it may be there are still prayers you can pray maybe there are still words of encouragement you can speak opportunities you can take your remaining helps us and we're very grateful it's not just the dramatic moments at the end of our lives for senior saints is it seeing what matters most in life every decision can be taken actually for others to make progress in knowing Christ and there's evidence of those decisions here all the time isn't there people giving up holiday to help for holiday bible club people giving up a free evening to prepare some teaching for a seven year old on a Sunday people living with less money so that other people can know the Lord Jesus saying no to the world's norm for your job path because it'll mean you can help others know the Lord Jesus also that others might progress in the faith Paul has an ideal he'd personally prefer because it's better by far but his love for the Philippians is such he'll forego his top choice so others can benefit well we'll stop here we'll come back and pick it up next week at verse 27 it's challenging these words as we read them we want to be like the apostle his purpose though is that there should be encouragement for believers who are suffering encouragement to look in the right place that is to have the right perspective to see things in life with the right importance life may be awful at the moment are you reading the right scale the right barometer how's Christ doing how's the proclamation of the gospel doing and how's the perspective on life of de life and death? Have we got death clear as gain? Not the process of death. There'd be much pain in that. But that to be with Christ in person. Have we got death clear as being with him? And are we making decisions not by our personal top choice, but by others knowing Christ more, that they might grow to know him too? going to turn to pray in just a few minutes I suggest we pause perhaps for a minute and then Catherine's going to come and lead our prayers but uh, let's um, meditate over the coming days and weeks on these extraordinary statements of the apostle I for one will be sitting in verse 21 for quite some time let's have a moment of quiet